All right, so here we are. We are today discussing um, a an interesting period in American history, and really in in global history. We're going to be looking at the period immediately before the arrival of the Pilgrims in North America in Massachusetts. Uh, the name of the talk is "Before the Mayflower: The Paths to 1620," and it's really going to be a talk that focuses on two separate threads of history that collide together in 1620. Now this year, 2020, for all that it has been and all the stuff that has gone on is an important anniversary year. It is the 400th anniversary of the arrival in Massachusetts at Plymouth of the, uh, the pilgrims, the pilgrims who sailed from Europe to the new world aboard their ship, the Mayflower. And there we see a dramatic image of the Mayflower being tossed on the, uh, on the seas. Now, the story of the Mayflower, the story of the pilgrims is one that we are mostly familiar with. We kind of know why the pilgrims came here. At least we think we kind of know why the pilgrims came here. And we, uh, in elementary school, tell the story of, of a group coming and seeking religious freedom. But the story is actually much more complex than that when looking at the pilgrims themselves. And we oftentimes neglect to tell the story of the people that were already here, that encountered the Mayflower. You know, these Englishmen show up and they show up in a land that was already inhabited. So hopefully what this talk will do is kind of take those two strands of the story, the pilgrim story, the story of the Englishmen coming across the Atlantic Ocean, and the native story, the people that were already here when the pilgrims showed up. So we're going to be looking at these two things separately and then kind of smashing them together at the end and, and getting us on the, uh, the trail of what we are familiar with with our story of the pilgrims in North America. And we're going to begin by looking at Native America, the native peoples that had lived in North America, Central America, and South America for at least 12 to 14,000 years. Um, one of the big kind of misconceptions that we often have when discussing early American history and discussing in particular the native peoples that lived in what is today the United States is that the natives were all essentially the same. The Native Americans were, were kind of a homogenous mass. But that is, in fact, completely inaccurate because the native peoples uh, were very diverse. They were different from one another. They spoke different languages, had different beliefs, lived and survived in different ways. Part of that had to do with the, the complex ecological systems in North America, um, the, the different environments in North America. If you think about our own daily lives here in the, the 21st century, uh, we are all living in Massachusetts and Massachusetts has usually has four seasons. Uh, we have winter where it's cold, we have spring where it's warm and all the flowers are blooming and everybody's sneezing. We have summer where it's hot and then we have fall which is kind of a transition from hot to cold. Uh, that is very typical of the Northeastern part of the United States. But if you look at other parts of North America, the weather cycles are different. The environment is different. Uh, for example, look at Florida. Florida is um, mostly kind of a giant, nasty, abysmal swamp. Yet there were native peoples that lived in Florida. And Florida is very different than, let's say, the Texas Panhandle or the Great Plains or the, uh, the Great Basin, the area kind of in Utah and uh, Colorado between the mountain ranges out west or the Pacific Northwest or the desert Southwest. So we have all of these different environmental regions and the people that lived in those environmental regions adapted to their environments. They, uh, their cultures, their ideas were very much shaped by what was around them. So the, the concept of Native America being this one 
block-like structure, this one group of people is really a, a popular misconception. There is tremendous diversity in North America among the various peoples. And you see that diversity indicated here on that map. Uh, the map is labeled major cultural areas. And what it shows are the, the general geographic ecological areas in which different groups settled. And you can see the name of some of the, the native peoples listed on there. And people survived through different means in these variety of regions, in these different areas. Now, for our purposes, for the purposes of this talk and this discussion, we're gonna look specifically at the area known as the Eastern Woodlands. On this map, it is the, uh, the area in kind of the dark green off on the right-hand side. Uh, the Eastern Woodlands, the Northern Eastern Woodlands, as opposed to the Southern Eastern Woodlands, because it is here in the Northern Eastern Woodlands that the first contacts between uh, Europeans, Englishmen, and natives actually occur. It is uh, on this east coast between um, kind of the Carolinas and southern Canada, where we have interactions between the English, the French, the Dutch, and the native populations. So we can see by looking at this eastern woodlands, um, the broad scope of it, going from the Atlantic Ocean out to the Great Lakes and going from the St. Lawrence River down to the, uh, the coastal area of North Carolina, a fairly big geographic area. Yet within this geographic area, there were numerous uh, different peoples, numerous different groups that lived, that survived, that competed with one another. And there were different linguistic groups among these um, these peoples that lived there. So there is tremendous diversity among the people of the Eastern Woodland, yet there are some cultural commonalities. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, among the cultural commonalities were some of the materials that these people used, the materials that they, they created to survive and to, to thrive in the environment that they were living in. One of the important um, items, the important aspects of material culture that is created in the Eastern Woodlands during the Eastern Woodland period was uh, ceramics. The Eastern Woodland peoples are the first native North American peoples to really use ceramics in, a, uh, in abundance. When you are doing archeology span in Eastern North America, in the Eastern part of the United States, um, and you find ceramics at an archeological site, it dates it to the woodland period, uh, that period from about 1000 to 1500 or so. That, uh, the ceramics are indicative of that Eastern woodland culture. On your screen, you see some examples of Eastern woodland type ceramics. Now the vessels that were used by these people could be very utilitarian, very plain, like the one you see there on the left, uh, on the right, excuse me. That is a rim shirt from a, uh, a, a utilitarian vessel, kind of a, a pot that was probably used for cooking. It wasn't meant to be pretty, it was meant to be functional. But some of the ceramics were intricately uh, decorated. You see some of those fragments on the, the left with various incisions and various decorative motifs uh, inscribed into the clay before the clay is baked into ceramic. Again, typical of the Eastern woodlands uh, that you would have. Utilitarian ware, you'd have more refined ware, you'd have decorated ceramic vessels. Uh, a couple of more examples of the, the ceramics that were used by the people of the Eastern woodlands are here on your screen. The nearly complete vessel on the left is a fantastic example of an Eastern woodland style pot, probably used for cooking. You can kind of see some of the scorch marking on, there on the side also lightly decorated. It does have some, some inlaid design there. The fragment on the right, however, shows a very intricate decorative pattern. Uh, it's only a fragment, a couple of pieces of a ceramic vessel, but you can see the, the artistry that went into it and the skill that went into designing and decorating these ceramic vessels. So these are essential elements of the um, culture of the people of the Eastern woodlands. Throughout Eastern North America, we find ceramics that are associated with these people of the Eastern Woodlands. Now, the livelihoods and the lifestyles of the Eastern Woodlands people was one that was um, 
seasonally nomadic, I guess is the best way to put it. They generally had a habitation area and would spend winter in one part of that habitation area uh, and summer in another part of that habitation area. And depending on the season, was uh, d d there, it influenced how they procured food, what they were going for, what they were hunting, whether or not they were farming, that sort of thing. So there was a degree of mobility among the Eastern Woodland peoples going from seasonal site to seasonal site. But as they moved, they did move in a village-like structure. So in the winter, you'd be near the water, in the, the, excuse me, in the summer, you'd be near the water, in the winter, you'd move away from the water and find a more sheltered area. But you were living with the same group of people in these seasonal cycles of migration from place to place to place. Now, what did that mean for the types of dwellings that the people of the Eastern Woodlands lived in? The dwellings had to be sturdy because they were seasonal, but they also had to be relatively easy to construct. And two of the typical uh, forms of shelter that were employed by many of the Eastern Woodlands people, particularly in the Northeast, but also to a lesser degree in the, the Southeast, are um, the two structures you see there on your screen, the longhouse and the wigwam, also sometimes called a witu. The longhouse, as the name implies, was a relatively long structure. It was designed to house two, three, four families. Uh, sent in the, usually in the longhouse, there was a central fire. Longhouses were slightly more elaborate to build, slightly more permanent than the wigwams. Wigwams were meant to be assembled relatively quickly, would house essentially one family for a short period of time, maybe a seasonal dwelling, um, or if on a long migration, a temporary shelter. Wigwams were meant to be thrown up relatively quickly, were stable, you could live in them for an extended amount of time, but they were uh, much more temporary than the longhouses. The longhouses themselves constructed of, um, of tree branches, constructed of tree bark, perhaps animal hides, all of it meant to, to provide shelter from the elements for the families that were living within them. So these are very typical structures that you would find among the Eastern Woodland people as they migrated from place to place, as they moved from their summer camps to their winter camps, they would construct these shelters, they would repair these shelters, they became the main dwellings that the Eastern Woodland peoples lived in. So how do we know this? How do we know what the native peoples, what their houses look like? How do we know what they did in their behavior. Well, we have a lot of evidence from archaeology. Uh, the archaeologists uh, studying the eastern woodlands uncover lots and lots of artifacts that tell us about how they lived, the structures they lived in, the ceramic vessels that they used. We already saw that. The, um, the tools, the stone tools that they used for hunting, for the processing of food, for cutting down trees. We have archaeological evidence for all of that. But we also have eyewitness accounts uh, from the late 16th century. During the 16th century and going into the 17th century, Europeans begin to make incursions into the Americas. Of course, Christopher Columbus in 1492 sails across the ocean blue and kind of um, begins a centuries long process of Europeans moving into the Americas, exploiting the Americas and interacting, not necessarily, not necessarily positively with the native inhabitants of the Americas. Well, in 16, uh, excuse me, 1585, the English were just getting into the game of European incursions into the Americas. To this point, the, leader, the leaders in kind of exploiting the Americas were the Spanish, and the Portuguese in South and Central America, uh, and the French in Canada. England was kind of on the sidelines. England had a lot of stuff going on in the 16th century. They were going through their, their own um, Protestant Reformation, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. So England was in internal domestic political turmoil. Once England did achieve political stability, however, uh, they did begin to look beyond the borders of England. I can't get them again. I can't get this picture on them. Beyond the borders of England. Um, and what you see is that the English are preparing an expedition. Uh, they want to get involved. 
So they send a couple of exploratory parties out to see what's there, to see what's in North America. And John White was a member of one of these exploratory parties. John White and the, the people he was with ended up going into a, a region that we today call Virginia, kind of the border region between Virginia and North Carolina. What he was looking for was a suitable place to establish an English outpost and a suitable place to put an English colony. And White is out there in the, um, in, in the Carolinas, in Virginia, making records of what he sees, the people he encounters and the way they lived. So what you see on your screen are two images uh, that were produced by John White during this voyage. When he goes back to England, he of course um, finalizes his drawings and publishes them and sells them uh, as a, a way of making money. Um, and his view of the new world, his view of the, the natives that he encountered are tremendously influential in our kind of interpretation of the native peoples. In any case, uh, White does have a series of these images, looking at villages, looking at the, the livelihoods of the native peoples, people of the Eastern woodland, uh, drawings of individuals, uh, mother and child and chiefs and warriors and that sort of thing. The two images you see on your screen, however, are uh, show specific ways in which the Eastern woodlands people survived. The upper image shows people uh, fishing. It shows the techniques that were used by the native peoples in the Carolinas, again, for fishing, for procuring fish. Now, just because these images were done in the Carolinas uh, doesn't mean that these weren't the same techniques that people were using in other parts of the East Coast and other parts of the Eastern woodlands. In fact, these fishing te techniques were probably very broad spread. So how people were fishing off the coast of Cape Fear is probably the same way that people were fishing off the coast of Cape Cod during the 16th century and probably had been for centuries. So we see the Native American fishermen out there in a dugout canoe um, using spears and using these kind of uh, net type things to catch the fish. They've also built a fish weir along the, the waterway right there. Fish weir is basically a series of um, narrow sticks that are lined up next to each other that trap the fish in them. Uh, as the fish are trying to swim through, they get caught in this fish weir and then the, the natives can go and pick them up at their, their leisure. So we see one aspect of the survival of the Eastern Woodlands people in this, this image by John White. The second image, the lower image there shows a Native American village, again, as interpreted by White. And we see uh, several of the, the longhouses laid out there in that village. We see a communal fire in the center of that and agricultural fields off to the right-hand side of the picture. You can't really see it on the image there, but it says the fields in which they plant their corn. So we can see how the, um, structures of Native American life in the Eastern woodlands were, were laid out. A, a typical village, the people interacting, the people conducting religious rituals, how they procured their food, where they planted their food, the, the woods off to one side, the forest off to one side, the large central fire in the middle. So we have hints of how the Native peoples survived. Um, now, again, it is important to realize that we are seeing this seeing these scenes through the lens of the eyes of a 16th century Englishman. And what he was seeing was something fantastical and new to him. Now, he probably tried his best to, to accurately capture what he saw, but some of his own biases probably made their way into the images. Some of his own ideas probably made their way into his depictions of native life. We know that there is factual, there are factual elements in there, but he might have misinterpreted some of what the people were doing. But they are a fascinating series of images that do give us this view of early native life, just at the period, just at the time when the English were about to make inroads into North America. Now, um, how did the people of the Eastern Woodland survive? What were their main sources of food? We know they produced ceramics for cooking things. We know they had these dwellings. They hunted. Hunting was an important aspect of, of survival. 
uh, hunting in the woods themselves, fishing along the coast and along the waterways. But the basis of their survival, the main source of calories, the main source of food for the people of the eastern woodlands was agriculture. And the three most important crops that the people of the eastern woodlands relied on were known collectively as the three sisters. There was corn, beans, and squash. All three of these um, crops are Native American crops. They are from the Americas. Uh, they're introduced into Europe after about 1600. But so these were things that the native populations in North America, particularly on the East Coast, but also in other parts of North America relied on for their sustenance, for their survival. They provided a relatively balanced diet in terms of calories and nutrients. Um, they allowed for uh, survival in um, times of slim hunting prospects. Uh, things like beans and corn can be preserved for a very, very long time once they're dried out. So they last for a long time and you supplement that with the the squash you supplement that with whatever game you can you can capture whatever fish you can find and that becomes a the really the source of nutrients the source of survival for the people of the eastern woodlands so we see a, a series of complex societies that are developing and thriving in eastern north america the number of groups of peoples that inhabited Eastern North America was, was in the hundreds. Um, that pre previous map I showed you kind of gives us an outline of where these different groups were located. And the relationship between the groups themselves was often complex, often in competition, sometimes in cooperation. The structures of the groups themselves was uh, often in in uh, in dispute, in negotiation. It was uh, not the same for every group. There was tremendous cultural diversity, tremendous uh, political diversity among the various groups of the Eastern Woodlands. So the idea of this monolithic Indian culture is something that is really inaccurate. That's not how society was. That's not what was happening in North America. Now, if we zoom in a little bit closer, in the Eastern Woodland, looking specifically here at Southern New England, you can see that even within this relatively small geographic area, there was, again, lots of diversity among the Native American peoples here. Now, all of these peoples, all of these groups that you see on the screen were uh, tied together in a linguistic group. Linguistics is a, an anthropological study. Anthropologists and others like to group things together. And what the, the linguistic group that ties the various peoples here together uh, was that it was the Algonquin group. Uh, the Algonquin language was a linguistic base that covered basically from about western, uh, excuse me, eastern Pennsylvania up through upstate New York into part of Canada. It was a similar, uh, a group of similar languages, much as today we would look at Western Europe and maybe French, Spanish, and Italian and label them the Romance languages. They all have common roots out of Latin. Uh, that was the same thing with the Algonquin language here in southern New England. They were all similar, related, structurally related, linguistically, though separate in their, their uh, use and in their function. So what you see on the map here are the major native groups that inhabited uh, southern New England from central and western Massachusetts with the, the Pocumtuck uh, and the Nipmuc down into what is today Connecticut with the, Tux, uh, the Tunxis and the Metabesic and the Pequot and the Mohegan and the Narragansett in Rhode Island and the Massachusetts, just in the area of Massachusetts Bay and south of the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag. The Wampanoag territory extended from basically what is today Weymouth, Massachusetts, down into eastern, southeastern Massachusetts, out into Cape Cod. And all of these groups that were living in close proximity were rivals in many ways. They were competing with each other for resources, for land. Um, they were often in uh, at war with one another. Uh, the Pequots, for example, in southeastern Connecticut were unpopular with their neighbors, I guess is one way to say it. The Pequots were um, disliked by everybody because the Pequots were constantly waging war, constantly attacking their neighbors. The Narragansetts in Rhode Island were 
largely uh, independent of the other groups. Again, related, but the Narragansetts went and did their own thing, uh, resisting the Pequots in rivalry with the Wampanoags, but kind of on their own. And then you had the Wampanoags over here in southeastern Massachusetts, who were the dominant entity in that region, but again, in, compass, in competition with the Narragansett, in competition with the Massachusetts. So you had local rivalries among the native peoples. Now, the Wampanoags themselves, and we're gonna focus on the Wampanoags because that is where the pilgrims end up, is in Wampanoag territory. As I said, their territory basically stretched from uh, Eastern Rhode Island all the way out to Cape Cod and from the islands, Nantucket and, and Martha's Vineyard up to basically Weymouth or Quincy uh, today. So this entire stretch of southeastern Massachusetts with the Cape and the islands was all part of Wampanoag territory in the uh, 1500s and in, in the 1600s. The Wampanoag were uh, a confederation in, in many ways of different groups. And you can see some of the main groups listed on this map here. The Patuxet, the Namaskit, uh, the, the Nosset out on the Cape, the Aquina out on um, Martha's Vineyard. These were essentially uh, Wampanoag villages that had their own heads, their own leaders, but they were all part of this larger entity of the Wampanoags. Um, they usually worked in conjunction with one another, had common enemies, spoke the same language, and they had the same religious uh, and economic and political structures. So this was the situation we see in the 15th, 16th, early 17th century. A Native America that is divided up, that is made up of these independent groups that are in competition with one another. Now, it's estimated that around 1600 or so, there were something between 40 and 60,000 inhabitants of the region we today call New England. And again, in these diverse groups living in different population centers throughout the region, related linguistically, oftentimes conducting trade with one another, oftentimes in competition with one another. And that was the situation we see when the Europeans, when the pilgrims show up at Plymouth uh, in 1620. But the pilgrims weren't really the first Europeans to interact with these native groups in New England. In fact, we begin to see European interaction with the uh, native peoples much earlier than 1620. In fact, by the end of the 15th century, beginning of the 16th century, so let's say around the year 1500 or so, um, Europeans are fishing in the waters off of Nova Scotia, off of Maine, off of Cape Cod. Uh, Europeans are pushing further and further afield in the wake of Christopher Columbus, in the wake of uh, John Cabot, who's the upper green arrow there on the, on the map. Europeans were coming out to fish in the abundant fisheries of the North Atlantic, off the Grand Banks, off of Cape Cod. Why does Cape Cod have its name Cape Cod? Well, what was out in the water? Lots of cod. The uh, European fishermen, as they were coming out across the Atlantic, as they were uh, engaged in the fishing industry in these, these uh, rich coastal waters, were catching numerous, numerous fish. But they have a problem. How do we get these fish that we are catching off the coast of North America back to Europe? It's a trip across the North Atlantic that could take several weeks. And what happens if we have these fish laying in the hold of our ship for several weeks? Well, by the time we get to Europe, that fish, those fish will be unedible and the, the ship will stink more than it already does. So what do the fishermen do? They begin drying their catches. They land their, their ships, they pull into shore and they remove their cargoes and they dry them on land and they salt them on land. Cod in particular, when it's dried and salted, uh, will last pretty much forever. Uh, it becomes hard as a, a, a board of wood and it's uh, unpleasant to eat, but it is very, very, very durable. So we see European fishermen drying their fish on the shores of North America, on the northern shores of North America. Uh, at first, the, some of the fishermen involved in this were the Portuguese. A and then you have the, uh, the Bretons from, uh, from Brittany in, in France. And then you have the French themselves and the Dutch come along, although the Dutch aren't really as interested in fish as they are in the fur trade. And then finally you have the English. 
So what we see uh, is a progression of Europeans making their way across the North Atlantic, not to settle, not to, to hunt or any of that thing, but to catch fish and then landing in North America to dry their fish, to preserve the fish for that transport back to Europe. Uh, what you see on your screen right now is a fanciful image of some of these early contacts between European fishermen and native peoples. Now, when the Europeans start showing up on the shore and coming ashore with boatloads of fish and drying their fish, the native inhabitants, naturally curious about who these guys are, start coming out and uh, the two sides kind of looking at each other begin to, to interact with one another. Some trade does take place and we see that going on in the foreground of this image over here. The European giving the uh, native man a knife in exchange for what looks like vegetables or something like that on a string. But you do begin to have these contacts. You do begin to have these, these relationships that are established. Some of the natives become so familiar with the Europeans coming and fishing and drying their fish on shore that they begin to know the names of all the ship captains and the names of the individual ships. They've established relations, they've established these contacts. Now, a lot of this is taking place further north from where we are, along the shores of Maine, again, along the shores of, of Nova Scotia and, and places like that. But there were contacts between the Europeans and the native peoples that were occurring up and down the coast of modern day New England. So it wasn't as if when the pilgrims showed up in 1620, it was completely out of the blue. It wasn't like it was something that had never happened before because there had been decades of these, these intermittent contacts around fishing and some basic trade that had taken place. Now here in Southern Massachusetts, in the, uh, the what is today the, the Cape Cod Bay, Europeans hadn't really ventured that far. Some uh, French explorers had come down that way, had kind of drawn a couple of preliminary maps. And really the Wampanoags were firmly in control of that region. The Wampanoags were not really interested in trading with the Europeans or dealing with the Europeans at all. The Wampanoags were quite prosperous in what they were uh, doing in this region. Uh, the image you see on your screen is a, a visual description of one of the Wampanoag settlements in the area of Cape Cod Bay, a place called Patuxet. Now why Patuxet is significant is because this is the area in which the pilgrims would land in 1620. Patuxet is essentially the location where Plymouth is established. Um, the image you see is a, from about 1606, again, taken from records of some of those Europeans who had ventured that far south, who had kind of given us descriptions. And what you see on the map are uh, clusters of cornfields surrounding what look like longhouses or wigwams. You see people there along the shore. You see forests kind of indicated by the trees there, some small islands in the uh, harbor itself. It was uh, a populous and uh, prospering village at this time. So we have some early 17th century contemporary images of um, the, the native inhabitants of New England of the region of Plymouth. This one's from 1606. If we jump forward uh, about a decade, you have the, um, the New England coast map that was drawn by John Smith. Now, the John Smith, of course, is famous because he was involved in the establishment of Jamestown down in Virginia. John Smith was a uh, pretty much a prototypical 17th century adventurer, uh, an Englishman who was going out to the New World, making maps, interacting with the natives, killing a few natives if he needed to, waging war against the French and the Spanish. He he was that guy. Um, that's his image there on this on the. Uh, the oval at the top of the picture with the big beard. And one of the voyages that John Smith makes while he is out exploring is he sails up the coast of uh, North America, the east coast of North America, and he draws this map that is the one of the earliest maps of New England. Now, to kind of situate you on the map, at the very bottom is Cape Cod. You can kind of see the arm curling around that looks like Cape Cod. And as you move up the coast, you see the Charles River there on the left. And you keep moving up and you have Cape Ann, and then you kind of head up into um, what is today New Hampshire and Maine as you continue up 
uh, up the map. This map that is drawn by John Smith um, is will become tremendously influential. He names a lot of the areas along the coast, names them after places in England, names geographic features after prominent Englishmen or after uh, English dynasties, that sort of thing. So you have this map created by John Smith that will influence some of the ideas of settlement in New England. Now, when John Smith is making his way up the coast, he does stop in Cape Cod Bay. He does uh, see Patuxet, the, the Wampanoag village. And he writes in his records that Patuxet was flourishing. It was a, a, a well-inhabited, flourishing little village. And then he continues on his way, finishes his navigations, draws his map, goes on other adventures. But what Smith did not know was that what he observed of Patuxet was essentially the last gasp of that settlement. It was the, the high point of the settlement and a, it was going to be followed by dramatic tragedy. Because all of this interaction that had been taking place between Europeans and um, natives came at a tremendous price. Europeans were not only bringing trade goods knives and things like that to North America. They were not only drying their fish there, but in their interactions with the native populations, they began to spread disease. And many of the diseases that were spread to the native populations were uh, diseases that Europeans had built natural immunities to, the Native Americans had not. So what happens in the early 1600s is a epidemic of death and destruction that sweeps across native populations in New England, a period that was referred to as the Great Dying. What we see during this three-year period from 1616 to 1619 are, is epidemic disease ravaging native populations. Uh, it's estimated that something like 90% of the native population in New England dies in this three-year period because of the introduction of European diseases. Now, we don't really know what the disease was that swept through the native populations. It may have been smallpox. It may have been something. It may have been bubonic plague. But we do know that it had a, a horrific impact on the native populations. Uh, and how do we know that? Because of records that are left by the Europeans when they show up. They talk about deserted villages that uh, has, uh, you know, skeletons laying on the surface because everybody in the village died and nobody was left to bury the dead. One village that suffers that fate is Patuxet. Patuxet, that had been a thriving community uh, a few years earlier, is essentially wiped off the map because of the spread of disease, because of the impact of European incursions. So this is the situation that we see as we approach 1620 in New England. What had once been thriving communities, tens of thousands of people broken up into various tribes and various groups with their own politics and rivalries is impacted by the spread of European diseases. And that leads to an imbalance in the powers. The Wampanoags are greatly affected by European diseases, the Narragansetts, who were further south, aren't affected as much, which means that the Narragansetts now are more powerful than the Wampanoags, and that'll have a role in uh, relations between the two groups. So while all of this is going on in North America, what's happening in England? Meanwhile, in England, England itself is going through a tumultuous time, uh, particularly in the 16th century. What we see happening in England is the uh, English Reformation. Now, what was the English Reformation? The basic idea was that England, the Kingdom of England, breaks with the Catholic Church. Uh, of course, the 16th century is the great period of reforma religious reformation across Europe. For a while, England resists reformation. England and the King Henry VIII remained loyal to the Pope and the Catholic tradition. But Henry has a problem that he needs help with. And Henry's problem is that he does not have a male child. He does not have a male heir. And Henry asks the Pope for a divorce. Can I divorce my wife? Because obviously we're not going to have male children. I need to get married to somebody younger so that we can have male children. The Pope says, no, you can't have a divorce, which of course offends Henry. And what does Henry do? He breaks with the church, establishing 
an English church. The establishment of the Church of England occurs during the reign of Henry VIII. Now you see Henry VIII there in that group of four men. He was the King of England. The other three men, Ridley, Latimer, and Tyndale were uh, important reformers during this time period who called for uh, changes and uh, changes in the religious structure of England supported in many ways the king's desire to break from the church, uh, from the Catholic church and establish religious, a new religion in England. The image on the right is a, um, a metaphorical image for the Protestant Reformation. It shows Henry VIII seated on the throne there holding the sword, resting his feet on the fallen pope kind of showing who is dominant, at least in the kingdom of England. So you have the establishment of the Church of England, the English Reformation in the middle of the 16th century. Now, of course, there is tremendous religious struggle in England. Um, one of Henry's daughters who eventually becomes queen, Queen Mary was a Catholic. She tries to reconvert England to Catholicism. That leads to all sorts of turmoil in England. When Mary dies without, a, without an heir, her younger sister Elizabeth becomes the queen of England. Elizabeth was a Protestant and she re-Protestantizes um, England. So you have this back and forth in England over the 16th century. And it's that religious turmoil that leads to the English being kind of late in the game for playing in the Americas and, and trying to get uh, a foothold in the Americas. In any case, by the time we get to the late 16th, early 17th century, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, has become the state religion in England. It has become the main church in England. But there were many who were opposed to the Church of England. They saw that the Church of England, or they thought that the Church of England was really just Catholicism under a different name. Many of the ideas, many uh, the structure of the religious services, the hymns that were sung, the prayers that were said, all were the same that were being used in the Roman Catholic Church. It's just that rather than the Pope being the head of the church, you had the king being the head of the church. So there were some Protestants in England who felt that the Church of England was not sufficiently removed from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, it is during this period of the late 16th, early 17th century that the Anglican Church really establishes its identity, really establishes its ideas. One of the important figures in doing so was the uh, scholar and uh, preacher, Richard Hooker. We see his image there on the lower right. He was one of the leading figures in kind of codifying Anglican theology and a Anglican dogma. Again, many thought that Anglicanism was too close to Catholicism. So another religious group springs up, a religious group in England that was influenced, uh, and there were actually followers of John Calvin, a uh, French and Swiss reformer, who looked to purify the church. These, this group in England come to be known as the Puritans. The Puritans wanted to stamp out any vestige of Catholicism from the church in England. The Puritans themselves were... Um, not welcomed very much by the Anglicans. They were viewed with suspicion. They were viewed as a little bit too extreme. But even among the Puritans, there was an even more extreme group. Those were called the separatists. The separatists felt that even the Puritan church, the purified reformed church in England wasn't enough and that a separate, entirely separate new entity had to be created. That would be the path to salvation. So what we see in the early 16th century is this religious conflict going on in England. The Anglican church, the, the authorized church, per persecuting the Puritans because the Puritans wanted to reform the church. And even the Puritans looking at the separatists as, whoa, you guys are too extreme. So all of this is playing out in late Elizabethan England. Well, when Elizabeth dies, in 1603, Queen Elizabeth I dies in 1603, she dies without a direct heir. She never has children. So the crown of England passes to a distant cousin who happens to be the King of Scotland. James, he's James VI of Scotland. He becomes King James I of England. James I will reign over England from 1603 to 1625. He's essentially, essentially unifies the um, kingdom of Scotland and the kingdom of England into one state with him as the head. And it is during the reign of King James 
that we really see uh, persecution of the Puritans and the separatists accelerating in England. Now, that's not a good situation if you are a member of, of the religious minority in England. You're seeing um, your co-religionists being uh, arrested, being thrown in jail, losing their homes, losing their property, losing their livelihoods. So what are you going to do? Well, what options do you have? You could convert to Anglicanism, but then you'd be abandoning your faith, or you could try to leave. And that is exactly what some of the separatists do. Uh, in 1608, many of the separatists, again, that most radical group of the Puritans, uh, decide to leave England. They are trying to escape the persecution that they're facing because of the Anglican church. And where do they go? But to the Dutch Republic, they go to the Netherlands. Uh, first settling in Amsterdam in 1608, and then the following year moving to Leiden. Now, why do they go to the Netherlands? Because in the Netherlands, you had religious freedom. There wasn't really a state church of the Netherlands. The, the Dutch themselves were very much um, open to people practicing whatever religion they wanted to do. That's one of the things we see about the Dutch in the 17th century, as they are building a global commercial empire. Whereas the Spanish were going and trying to convert people, the Dutch weren't. The Dutch didn't care what religion you were. The Dutch were only interested in making a profit. They were driven purely by money, not necessarily by religious sentiment. In any case, the separatists, a group that we'll now call the pilgrims, take shelter in the Netherlands, take shelter in Leiden. And that's the image you see there on the screen. The large church in the middle is the Peterkerk. Uh, that's the neighborhood where the, the English separatists, the Puritans, uh, the pilgrims settle when they are in Leiden. Now they stay there for about a dozen years total from Amsterdam and Leiden. Uh, but very soon the pilgrims in the Netherlands realize that they are kind of out of place. For the most part, the separatists came from agricultural backgrounds. They were farmers. They were husbandry, uh, practiced husbandry, animal husbandry. They weren't city dwellers. And when they arrived in these the urban Netherlands, they were out of place. They didn't know how to adapt to the city. Uh, most of the jobs that they found were low paying jobs. They were kind of uh, uh, minimum wage workers in the, the garment industry, the textile industry in the Netherlands. And it wasn't really a, a good economic situation for them. They did have their religious freedom, however. They could practice their religion without fear of imprisonment, without fear of persecution. But it wasn't ideal. Um, some of the pilgrims in the Netherlands actually were worried because their children, rather than following the precepts of their religion, were kind of acclimatizing to Dutch civilization, to Dutch society. Um, Amsterdam, even in the 17th century, was very much like Amsterdam today. You could pretty much get away with anything in Amsterdam. It was a very permissive city. Uh, it was a city where people enjoyed life. And that kind of went uh, counter to what the separatists had envisioned. So by 1619 or so, 1620, the separatists, the English Puritans, the English separatists in the Netherlands, decide they don't want to be in the Netherlands anymore. They are going to see if they can get permission to travel across the Atlantic Ocean and establish an outpost in the northern reaches of Virginia. Now, by this point, uh, the Virginia colony had been established. Jamestown's established in 1607. And the territory of Virginia stretched on the maps from basically North Carolina to the mouth of the Hudson River. That big chunk of the east coast of the United States was considered Virginia. So the uh, pilgrims look for permission from King James to leave and go establish a colony. They eventually get that permission. And what happens? The uh, pilgrims rent a couple of ships. They hire a couple of ships to carry them across the Atlantic Ocean. One of those ships, the one that actually makes it across the ocean, was the Mayflower. And in 1620, um, the Mayflower sets sail from England with uh, about 102 pilgrims on board, roughly 30 crew members and a whole bunch of dogs and sheep and goats and, and other livestock. And the pilgrims set forth from Europe, from England, hoping to escape religious persecution. They want to go and establish their own haven where they can practice their religion freely. Now, the voyage of the Mayflower going across the, the Atlantic Ocean 
takes a really long time. Um, they are at, at sea for several weeks. The Mayflower itself is not a luxurious ship. It's relatively small. It's being tossed about on the waves. I'd imagine there was a great deal of seasickness among these uh, English farmers throwing the, the animals. The stench on the ship must have been unbelievable. Yet in November of 1620, the Mayflower does make landfall. First, stopping at the northern tip of Cape Cod, what is today Provincetown, uh, a small group of the pilgrims get off the boat. They explore the sand dunes there, don't see a suitable area for settlement, and they head back out across uh, Cape Cod Bay, and they make landfall at an area that they call Plymouth. Now, the area that the pilgrims land in and decide to settle in was the location that previously had been Patuxet the Wampanoag village. When the pilgrims arrive there, Patuxet is completely abandoned. There are the, the remains of the structures, the remains of the agricultural fields, but no people are there because the population had, been, had died off because of the great dying uh, of the previous couple of years. So the pilgrims arrive in a cleared area set for habitation. And they think that this is divine intervention, that this is a gift of God, bringing them to this location where they could uh, find shelter. They managed to find the uh, the stores of food that had been set aside by the Wampanoags there before they had all died at Patuxet. So the pilgrims decide to settle there at Plymouth, at the area they call Plymouth. Now that first winter at Plymouth was miserable. Um, many of the pilgrims die because of malnutrition, because of sickness, because of exposure. They were not prepared for a New England winter. And in the spring of 1621, it looked like the Plymouth colony, the pilgrims were on the verge of, of failing in their settlement. How were they going to survive? They didn't know how to survive in this new world. Well, what happens? Uh, as luck would have it, in March of 1621, um, the pilgrims are greeted or are met by a, a surprise visitor. A Native American man wanders into the center of the small pilgrim settlement and begins speaking to them in English. This man is, comes to be known as Samoset. And Samoset was from the Abenaki, a group from uh, Maine, who happened to be visiting the Wampanoags near uh, Cape Cod. And um, Samoset spoke some English because he had been in contact with those English sailors that had been drying their fish along the shores of Maine. So the story is that Samoset walks into Plymouth, the pilgrims are all shocked at the boldness of this act, and he addresses them in English. He says, welcome Englishmen. And then he asks, do you have any beer? So we kind of know how the, uh, the relations in Maine were going between the English fishermen and the natives. The pilgrims are of course shocked by this, but they are in a way relieved by this because there is someone that they can communicate with. Now, Samoset spoke some English, but he wasn't necessarily fluent in the language. He does make it known, however, that there is someone nearby who does speak English much better than he does. So Samoset departs, and he returns a few days later with another native man, uh, a man by the name of Tisquantum, who comes to be called Squanto by the, by the pilgrims. Now, Tisquantum was actually of the Patuxet people. He, the pilgrims were living on the remains of what was his village. Now, how did Squanto survive the great dying? Well, he wasn't there when, in a, when it occurred. The story of Squanto is that he had been kidnapped by an English sea captain um, earlier while well, he was a young man. Um, the sea captain's name may have been Weymouth. We don't know, there's a couple of different names associated with that. But in any case, Squanto and several other Native Americans were kidnapped and taken back to England. And he lived in England for several years. And while he was in England, he learned the English language. He then manages to make his way back to North America, hitches a ride with another English sea captain and comes back to his ancestral land to find everybody dead. Um, so there, Squanto is kind of a tragic figure in many ways, but he does appear in March uh, of 1621 speaking English, able to communicate with the pilgrims. And as legend has it, Squanto teaches the pilgrims how to 
survive in North America, what crops to plant, how to tend them, how to make sure they flourish. And Squanto becomes the interpreter for the pilgrims and the rest of the Wampanoags uh, who are led at this time by a, a sachem named Massasoit. So what we see happening in Plymouth is the collision of two worlds, the European world of the pilgrims, these religious separatists who are fleeing England to find religious sanctuary, someplace where they could practice their religion freely, and the Native American world that had been um, turned upside down because of the presence of Europeans. 1620, 1621, these two worlds collide. And it is there that we see the roots, the beginnings of the story of the United States. Now, in the years following 1620, in the years following the arrival of the Mayflower, uh, a few other ships do bring other separatists out of England, other pilgrims out of England, and deposit them in North America at Plymouth. And what we then begin to see is growing tensions between the Englishmen, the pilgrims, and the Wampanoags. At first, they work as partners. The Wampanoags see the pilgrims, the arrival of the English as perhaps a way of counterbalancing the rising power of the Narragansetts, and they do form a relationship and an alliance, but soon that alliance will fall apart, and what we see by the end of the uh, 17th century is that the English and the native peoples are at war across New England. But this is the story of what happens before 1620. Mm -hmm.